Chapter 20 From Business Culture to Great Depression The 20s 1920 to 1932 Part 1 and 2 In May 1920, at the height of the Red Scare, police arrested two Italian immigrants alleged to have participated in a Massachusetts robbery at a factory in which a guard was killed. The accused, Nicola Sacco, a shoemaker, and Bartolomeo Vanzetti were anarchists who hoped for a society without government, churches, and private property. They saw violence as an appropriate means for enacting social change, but very little evidence linked them to the crime. Eyewitness testimony was contradictory and other evidence was disputed. Nonetheless, in the anti-radical and anti-immigrant atmosphere of the Red Scare, their conviction was inevitable. When the men were found guilty and sentenced to death, their multiple appeals garnered international attention and sympathy. A movement to save their lives attracted support from many in the United States, including Felix Frankfurter, a future Supreme Court Justice. The governor of Massachusetts responded to protests by appointing a commission headed by Abbott Lawrence Lowell, Harvard University's president and a longtime official of the Immigration Restriction League. The commission upheld the verdict and death sentences, and on August 23, 1927, Sacco and Vanzetti were executed by electric chair. The Sacco-Vanzetti case exposed much about America in the 1920s, from the Red Scare's erosion of civil liberties to the cultural division sparked by immigration and the seeming triumph of capital over labor in a decade of apparent prosperity. Even though the decade has been called the Jazz Age and the Roaring Twenties, signaling its innovations in music, its sexually liberated women, roaring stock market, and consumer goods, not all Americans welcomed the emerging secular commercial culture. Some feared ethnic and racial diversity in what they saw as the moral degradation of urban life, and they expressed their apprehension in anti-immigrant and religious sentiment. The chief business of the American people, said Calvin Coolidge, president after Warren G. Harding's death in 1923, is business. Economic expansion, partnership between business and government, and business values seemed greater in the 1920s than at any previous point in American history. After the post-war recession receded in 1920, the decade was one of extraordinary prosperity. Productivity and output skyrocketed as new industries such as chemicals and electronics grew and older industries adopted Ford's moving assembly line. Automobiles so stimulated economic growth that auto factories, not iron and steel mills, came to embody American industrial power. Car production tripled in the decade. General Motors surpassed Ford, and by 1929, half of American families owned cars. The auto industry sparked the growth of steel, rubber, oil, road construction, and other economic sectors, and promoted tourism and the expansion of suburbs. In this decade, America's multinational corporations also extended their penetration of the international trade markets. The dollar became the most important currency in the world trade, and American industry still led other nations in output. In the 1920s, consumer goods for the first time became attainable by most Americans. Goods made available by credit and installment buying plans like vacuum cleaners, telephones, washing machines, and refrigerators transformed daily life. Advertising and marketing professionals found new ways to compel Americans to purchase items from the new industrial cornucopia. Americans spent more time on leisure activities from vacations to sports and movies. Radios and phonographs brought mass entertainment into private homes and birthed the new celebrity culture. A French visitor, André Siegfried, wrote in 1928 that a new society had emerged in which Americans valued their standard of living above all else. Americans' willingness to amass enormous debts in order to purchase consumer goods seemed to replace 19th century values of thrift and self-denial. Work, once seen as a point of pride and skill or collective empowerment in trade unions, now seemed only a means to pursue individual fulfillment through consumption and entertainment. Despite the abundance of mass consumer society, the fruits of economic expansion were very unequally distributed. Real wages rose by one quarter between 1922 and 1929, but corporate profits rose at more than twice this rate, and economic concentration continued, with a smaller number of firms and banks controlling more of industry and finance. In early 1929, the share of national income of the wealthiest 5% of American families exceeded that of the bottom 60%. The majority of families had no savings, and 40% of Americans lived in poverty, unable to enjoy the new consumer economy. Improved productivity allowed goods to be made with fewer workers, and while employment grew in some sectors, 
such as the professions, retail, and education, manufacturing employment dropped significantly for the first time in American history. Deindustrialization began in the old industrial northeast as business moved south to take advantage of cheap and non-union labor. Farmers were also excluded from prosperity. American agriculture had reached its zenith in World War I, when Europe's need for food and government policies had kept farm prices high. But increasing mechanization and use of fertilizer and pesticides elevated output even as world demand stagnated, steadily reducing farm incomes and forcing tens of thousands of farm foreclosures. In the 1920s, for the first time in U.S. history, the number of farms and farmers declined. Extractive industries like mining and lumber also suffered from overproduction in the world market. Even before the 1930s, rural America was suffering from economic depression. Although high unemployment crippled much of Europe in the 1920s, America's high wages, efficient industry, and mass consumption projected a magical image of American wealth and permanent prosperity across the world. The Committee on Public Information's propaganda campaigns during World War I persuaded advertisers that it was possible to sway the minds of whole populations, and many businesses established public relations departments to defend corporate practices and win a distrusting public. They successfully changed public attitudes toward Wall Street. Congressional hearings from 1912 to 1914, held by Louisiana Congressman Arsene Pujol, had exposed the big Wall Street's bank's manipulation of stock prices and strengthened popular views that investors were fleeced in the stock market. By the 1920s, however, with stock prices rising, the market gained more investors, and by 1928, 1 1.5 million Americans owned stock, more than at any previous time in U.S. history. With the defeat of the 1919 labor revolt and the dissolution of wartime regulations, business used the language of Americanism and industrial freedom against unions. Some corporations in the 1920s adopted new styles of management, called welfare capitalism, in which they offered employees private pensions, medical insurance plans, job security, and leisure programs. These businesses celebrated their attention to the human factor in industry. But more employers adopted the American plan, whose basis was the open shop, a workplace free of government regulation and unions, except, in some cases, company unions that were created and controlled by management. They believed collective bargaining infringed on the liberties of management and argued that prosperity depended on complete freedom for business. Public relations campaigns linked unionism with socialism and sinister foreigners, and even progressive companies hired strikebreakers and detectives and blacklisted union members to prevent or defeat unions and strikes. In this hostile environment, unions lost more than two million members, and unions capitulated to employer demands in order to prevent their annihilation. Like unions, feminists tried to adapt to the new conservative atmosphere of the 1920s. Suffrage in 1920 ended the ties of solidarity that had united various groups of women reformers. Black feminists now insisted that the movement demand the enforcement of the 15th Amendment in the South, but white activists offered little support. Long-standing divisions between two competing conceptions of women's freedom, one based on motherhood, the other on individual autonomy and the right to work, now took shape in a debate over an equal rights amendment to the Constitution, advocated by Alice Paul and the National Woman's Party. The proposed amendment would eliminate all legal distinctions on account of sex. Paul argued that now that women had the vote, they no longer needed special legal protections and needed equal access to employment, education, and other opportunities. But women reformers who supported mothers' pension and laws limiting women's work hours, which the ERA threatened to dismantle, vehemently opposed the ERA. Every major women's organization other than the National Women's Party opposed the ERA. The ERA campaign failed, and in 1929, Congress repealed the Shepherd Towner Act of 1921, which had offered federal assistance to programs for infant and child health. Pre-war feminism's emphasis on personal freedom blossomed in a growing consumer society, and women's liberation became a lifestyle promoted by advertisers and mass entertainment, detached from political or social radicalism. Sexual freedom now meant individual autonomy or personal rebellion. The young, single flapper who smoked and danced, sported short hair and skirts, and used new birth control devices came to symbolize the new woman. Chapter 20, Part 2 Progressivism disintegrated in the 1920s. Government success in creating mass hysteria during the war appeared to erode the foundation of democracy. The rational, self-directed citizen 
Sigmund Freud pointed to the unconscious, instinctual basis of human behavior. IQ tests seemed to show that many Americans were mentally unfit for self-government. In the 1920s, Walter Lippmann published two incisive critiques of democracy, Public Opinion and The Phantom Public, in which he repudiated progressives' beliefs that intelligence could solve social problems in a mass democracy. Lippmann argued that American voters were ill-informed, irrational, and failed to scrutinize policies or candidates. Most problems, he argued, were beyond the understanding of ordinary men and women. The independent citizen was a myth. The government, journalists, and advertisers, he suggested, had perfected the art of creating and manipulating public opinion, what Lippmann called the manufacture of consent. In 1929, sociologists Robert and Helen Lind published Middletown, a study of life in Muncie, Indiana, a typical Midwestern community. They found that leisure and consumption had replaced politics as the center of public life, and declining voter participation, among other indicators, confirmed their observations. Government policy reflected the pro-business climate of the decade. Business lobbyists dominated national Republican Party conventions, calling on the federal government to lower taxes on personal incomes and corporate profits, maintain high tariffs, and reinforce employers' anti-union campaigns. To some, Presidents Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge appointed so many pro-business members of the Federal Reserve Board, Federal Trade Commission, and other progressive era agencies that they seemed to repeal the regulatory state altogether. The government resumed issuing court injunctions to halt strikes, as it did with the walkout of 250,000 railroad workers in 1922. Under William H. Taft, appointed Chief Justice in 1921, the Supreme Court stayed extremely conservative, and a return to laissez-faire jurisprudence diminished progressive policies that enhanced federal power. In 1923, the court struck down Mueller v. Oregon in a decision that overturned a minimum wage law for women in the nation's capital. The administration of the lackluster president, Warren G. Harding, became one of the most corrupt in the nation's history. Although his cabinet had a few men of talent and integrity, such as Secretary of State Charles Evan Hughes and Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover, Harding appointed cronies who used their office for private gain. The most famous of several corruption scandals involved the leasing of government oil reserves to a businessman at Teapot Dome, Wyoming, by Secretary of the Interior Albert Fall, who was paid $500,000 for his services. As a result, Fall became the first cabinet member in history to receive a felony conviction. Harding's successor, Calvin Coolidge, who won fame as a Massachusetts governor for using straight troops to end a Boston policeman's strike in 1919, was uncharismatic, but compared to Harding, seemed an honest Yankee. Coolidge continued Harding's policies without the corruption and scandal. In 1924, Coolidge was re-elected by a huge margin, defeating Democratic candidate John W. Davis, a Wall Street lawyer who had been nominated by a badly divided Democratic convention. One-sixth of the electorate in 1924, voted for Robert La Follette, the candidate of a new progressive party whose platform called for higher taxes on wealth, public ownership of railroads, farm relief, and a ban on child labor. Coolidge described the progressive platform as a plan for a communistic and socialistic America. La Follette won the endorsements of progressives like Jane Addams and the American Federation of Labor, but raised little money and he carried only Wisconsin. But his candidacy showed that discontent persisted under the surface of prosperity and conservatism. Foreign affairs also reflected the alliance between business and government. The decade saw a retreat from Wilsonian internationalism towards unilateral American actions mostly intended to boost exports and investment opportunities abroad. The so-called isolationism of the 1920s was a reaction against disappointments over Wilson's aggressive military and diplomatic stance. The United States hosted the Washington Naval Arms Conference of 1922, which secured smaller navies for Britain, France, Japan, Italy, and the United States. But the country stayed outside the League of Nations, and American tariffs were raised to their highest levels in history, repudiating Wilson's commitment to free trade. Foreign policy was largely developed in private economic relationships rather than government activity. The United States emerged from World War I as the world's major manufacturing and financial power. In the 1920s, New York bankers, sometimes acting alone and sometimes with help from the Harding and Coolidge administrations, made huge loans to European and Latin American governments. American industrial firms, especially in auto, agricultural machinery, and electrical equipment manufacturing, established overseas plants to supply the world market and find cheap labor.
American investors gained control over raw materials such as copper in Chile and oil in Venezuela. When American economic interests seemed threatened, the government sent in the troops, invading once more in Nicaragua to suppress a nationalist revolt. Wartime and post-war repression, prohibition, and pro-business policies in wartime in the 1920s damaged progressives' belief that the federal government could represent national purpose and enhance freedom. Progressives gained a new appreciation of civil liberties, rights that an individual may assert even against democratic majorities, as fundamental features of American freedom. Reformers now encouraged open and democratic debate, and in the 1920s, a coherent concept of civil liberties and legal protections for freedom of speech against the government began to emerge. Wartime and post-war repression persisted in the 1920s. Lynchings continued, and people endorsing free speech or radical doctrines were arrested and attacked by authorities and private citizens. Government agencies such as the Postal and Customs Services censored books considered obscene. A Watch and Ward Committee in Boston excluded dozens of books from bookstores, including works by Sinclair, Tracer, and Hemingway. Movie producers feared that scandals involving actors might reinforce beliefs that movies promoted immorality, and in 1922, the film industry adopted the Hayes Code, which barred movies from depicting nudity, adultery, and long kisses. Only in 1951 would the Supreme Court offer First Amendment protections for film. Though more and more Europeans consumed American popular culture, some began to see American as culturally vapid. The British novelist D. H. Lawrence, who lived briefly in the United States, said that America might take pride in being the land of the free, but the free mob had destroyed the right to dissent. American artists dissatisfied with America's conservatism and materialism, and the ones that wanted to drink legally, migrated to Paris. Concern for civil liberties grew from the arrests of anti-war dissenters under the Espionage and Sedition Acts, which inspired the formation of a group in 1917 that three years later became the American Civil Liberties Union, or the ACLU. For the rest of the 20th century, the ACLU took on many of the important legal cases that established the rights revolution in America. The ACLU helped inject meaning into traditional liberties such as freedom of speech and invented new rights such as the right to privacy. But the ACLU began as a coalition of pacifists, progressives, and lawyers outraged by the violation of Americans' rights by the government during World War I. Before the war, the Supreme Court had done little to protect the rights of unpopular minorities. Initially, the court itself restricted civil liberties. In 1919, the court upheld the constitutionality of the Espionage Act and the conviction of Charles T. Schenck, a socialist who sent anti-draft leaflets through the mails. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes spoke for the court when he declared that the First Amendment did not prevent Congress from prohibiting speech that presented a clear and present danger of inspiring illegal activity. Free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing panic, stated Holmes. This became the basis of Supreme Court decisions in future Supreme Court cases, but since it allowed public officials to determine what kind of speech was dangerous, it proved an arbitrary doctrine. In 1919, the court also upheld the conviction of Jacob Abrams and five other men for passing out pamphlets criticizing America's military intervention in Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution, but a minority dissented, forming the basis for future defense of free speech as necessary in the great marketplace of ideas later on in the decade. By the end of the 1920s, the court had invalidated state laws making it illegal to advocate unlawful acts or changes in the political or economic system. Not all Americans embraced modern urban culture and its religious and ethnic pluralism, mass entertainment, and sexual liberation. Evangelical Protestants felt threatened by an apparent decline in traditional values and the increased visibility of Catholicism and Judaism caused by immigration. They also opposed modernists with Protestant denominations who wanted to integrate science and religion and adapt Christianity to the new secular culture. Fundamentalists, convinced that the Bible's literal truth was the basis of Christian doctrine, started campaigns to exercise modernism from Christianity and restrict individual freedoms. Billy Sunday, a professional baseball player who became a revivalist preacher, was perhaps the best known of the fundamentalists, and he may have preached to as many as 100 million people with a message damning Darwinism and drink. Fundamentalism flowered both in rural and urban areas, and it succeeded through prohibition and reducing alcohol consumption in many places. But many Americans saw prohibition as a violation of their personal freedoms. Prohibition also earned huge profits for those who trafficked in illegal alcohol and made for pervasive government corruption.